Of course, today I'm not going to talk about EVM. I'm going to talk about WebAssembly. And um, my topic of choice is Fizzy, which is an interpreter uh, our team has written. And this was basically the culmination of, um, of the work we have done uh, on the topic of WebAssembly. Um, I would also mention that Pavel, who is, uh, whose talk is after mine, will cover a lot of the, the really um, nitty gritty details regarding the, the testing and, and uh, all the different findings we have come across uh, with Fizzy. Uh, but I will first just give like an overview um, of the, the topic of interpreters and then go into Fizzy in a bit more detail. And let me, if this works, okay. Yeah, so as, as you mentioned, uh, um, our team is just called Ypsilon and we don't really have a website apart from uh, this HackMD, but we publish uh, all the different findings and uh, specifications um, uh, um, we do. And there's quite a few of them. We also publish on, on ETH research and Ethereum magicians, but of course, all of these are rather Ethereum um, centric. And uh, currently we're mostly uh, working on, on EVM related optimizations. Um, but as you will see, a lot of the work we have done um, goes back and forth within EVM and WASM. And the learnings we had on either of these influenced um, the things we have done on the other. And uh, previously our team was called just eWASM and the project itself was also called eWASM. Um, but even in those times, we, um, in practice, we focused on execution, so not only WebAssembly. Uh, and just having a, um, a new team name just helps in making it a bit more clear that you know, our topics are a bit more uh, varied than just WebAssembly itself. Um, so yeah, I mean, I do have to give a bit of a background here, um, but I think it will be interesting um, because most of the other projects who have been on the conference today, they're not really using interpreters. As far as I've seen, everybody is using uh, Wasmer, um, which um, if I know correctly, it is mostly an ahead of time compiler, but it may also have an interpreter and a JIT component. But I think it is a AOT, which is, um, the, the version everybody is, is, is uh, using. Um, compared to that, the interpreters are quite a different uh, beast. Um, so just going back to the actual background, you know, how all of this started and, and you know, why we made any of these decisions. Uh, I have to go back to the very beginning, which was in 2016, or rather in 2015, when we started to work on WebAssembly. And I believe um, this was the, the, the first application of WebAssembly uh, to like a blockchain context. And our initial requirements were quite simple. We just wanted deterministic execution. Uh, we wanted instant startup time and we wanted fast execution time. So these were the requirements. Um, and here I, I need to, because I said, you know, we want deterministic execution. I want to expand a tiny bit, you know, what that, does that mean? Um, so under this, we mean that uh, we mean two points. The first point is um, that there must be some kind of a limit um, and uh, within that limit execution has to always stop at the same place, no matter um, you know, how many times you run it, where, where do you run it, et cetera. And this limit is, is mostly accomplished with metering, which many others already have um, talked about today. The second point is that uh, under determinism, the results have to be identical of the execution, uh, no matter which uh, host machine uh, you run it on. And, you know, whether it's like an x86, whether it's an ARM, whether it's any kind of other um, exotic machine, it has to result in the very same outcome. Um, and here I mentioned like two important points uh, which could cause concern. The first is uh, any kind of floating points um, because floating points can be implemented differently across different platforms. And in fact, uh, x86 and ARM implement some parts differently. Um, I guess in the past, like ARM hasn't been such a huge issue um, um, because like all the, the servers were really focused on like x86. Um, but in the recent years, of course, with phones and uh, uh, most recently with the, the Apple M1, ARM is, is uh, becoming you know, more heavily used um, in, in different contexts. Uh, so this point on floating points becomes you know, more important than it may have been in the past. The second point is that different host computers, and this doesn't only apply to, to different CPUs, but rather different OSs, 
uh, different operating systems may have like different default stack sizes. One example is that Mac OS versus Linux, the Mac OS has a much smaller default stack size. Um, and what this can cause is that uh, if you recurse, uh, you make multiple um, calls, and those could uh, result in a, a failure at different points of time, depending on how much uh, stack space you have. Um, so that, that's all I wanted to say about determinism. And, and now, you know, with, with uh, knowing what the initial requirements were, when we started with E-Wasn't, uh, these were the, our expectations. We expected that we may have some issues with determinism, with metering, and maybe with the interfaces, how to use WASM in, in the context of contracts. And we expected there won't be any issues with speed and there would be an, um, a lot of different VMs we could use. So these were our expectations. Um, do you guys think that you know, we were right? Uh, obviously, if I list these, no, we weren't right. Um, so what we expected and what actually happened. What actually happened is that speed um, it was an issue. And more importantly, the, the lack of choice for VMs and different kind of VMs, that was definitely a, a giant issue. And as we learned, um, these different VMs may have different problems uh, associated with them. And, and especially I mentioned AOTs and JITs, um, more importantly, JITs, of course, um, which we have found some issues with. And then for the, the points we we hope that there wouldn't be any issues with. Um, actually, those were the things, you know, we hope that speed and the VMs weren't the issues, but of course those were the main issues. Um, so instead of these, what we found is that um, determinism, determinism and metering isn't that bad. Um, those can be solved and they can be solved quite easily. Um, so it's really just the speed and the VMs which became the problem. Um, so based on these, our initial choices, you know, how to accomplish eWASM uh, was that we wanted to inject metering into WASM code. We didn't want it to change any kind of VM. We just wanted to use uh, off-the-shelf VMs. And uh, more importantly, we also wanted to use browsers and, and browsers on the phone because we hoped like light clients would uh, become, you know, more important than they have uh, become so far. And we expected that a lot of the execution actually happens on the phone where the browser would have a WASM VM built in. And since we cannot really modify a VM in the browser, um, the obvious choice is that we wanted to uh, inject metering in the WASM code. Um, so that means we modify the WASM code prior to execution. We insert extra statements, uh, which um, counts the execution steps, and we use different um, costs for different kinds of instructions. And for example, a more complex a call instruction is likely more expensive than just a, a regular addition. Um, secondly, we wanted to inject call depth check into WASM code, similar to metering. And this is to ensure that the different stack sizes wouldn't cause any, any difference. And lastly, we just wanted to reject any code which has floating points. In our use case, floating points weren't crucial. The easiest way was just to reject um, the use of them. Um, okay, so. With all these decisions, uh, we started working, we got everything done um, to like init initial prototype level. And these were results in 2018. Um, back then we used Binarian and V8, um, uh, which is um, the, the JavaScript engine of Chrome and also used in, in Node.js. Um, so the good results were that everything works. The, the metering overhead is, is not terrible, it's, it's quite okay. 64-bit uh, operations are really fast um, compared to, to the EVM, of course, and 256-bit operations are not as fast as we hoped and definitely not as fast as um, they are on the EVM. So, okay, but this doesn't look that bad, right? So are there any problems? Of course, there were problems. Um, V8, so when I said, you know, it, it works and, and it is fast, of course, I mean V8. So V8 was pretty fast. Um, but we have found some issues with, with V8, which is, uh, or at the time, at least, it was a JIT. Um, with JITs, um, the, the, the problem case we have found is uh, an attacker could craft a, a piece of WASM code, uh, which increases the compilation time of the WASM code into the native code um, excessively. 
And this is uh, basically a case where somebody could uh, DOS attack uh, the network. Um, at the time, there weren't any um, ahead of time compilers or at least stable versions of them. Um, so basically we just decided, okay, we have to, to pause to work on this. We, we didn't want it to write a VM, right, at all. Um, and then binary and was pretty slow. So we, we switched to, to Webit, um, with, which was at the time the, the next best, best option. So we're talking about 2018. Um, so in, in like early 2018, when we started work on, on Webit, um, obviously here, I don't want to give like a, you know, a day-to-day -day timeline because the, over these years, of course, a lot of things happened. So this is just like an excerpt. Um, but in like uh, 2018 with Webit, we have mostly done different optimizations on the interpreter itself. Um, I just mentioned a, a few here. Um, one interesting one is uh, we combine multiple WASM instructions into uh, just super instructions. So one combined instruction, which does the sum of all those. Um, and this is of course, not like a novel idea. This is exactly uh, what JITs also do and, and ahead of time compilers. Uh, this is a very logical step to do. Uh, in case of interpreters, it is also very logical uh, because you can skip any of the overhead of the uh, interpreter loop, as well as the overhead of each of these individual instructions. Uh, as expected, this gave like a huge boost. Um, we also did some other uh, smaller um, optimizations regarding different checks. And lastly, uh, which is like a similar improvement in terms of speed and then the super instructions is we translated known host function calls into um, like internal custom instructions. Um, and the, the kind of host functions we are interested in is of course, as I mentioned, 256 bit uh, operations were kind of slow to, compared to what we expected. Um, so we designed like a, an API where basically a big num library uh, exposes as host functions. And that worked pretty well, but the speed could still be improved. So the improvement, uh, the way to improve it is to translate those calls into, sorry, um, into custom instructions. And all of these changes um, made quite a big difference. Um, so this is a link uh, which goes to our fork of Webit and um, there are many different branches doing these different experiments. Um, I, I won't really <laughs> explain all of them, but um, yeah, please go ahead and browse. So the results were that Wabit is, is pretty fast. Um, um, so this on the right is like what stock Webit did. This on the left is what the native Rust code would do. And the middle is our optimized Webit, um, which is, is pretty good. Um, the red one is the startup time and the blue is the actual execution time. Um, so all of that combined, um, we are like at, 3x the, the native, 3, 4x the native, but it's insanely more fast than, you know, not doing any of these optimizations. So we're quite happy. Um, but of course, there were some, some new problems. Um, mainly that Webit and especially our changes, it's, it's not production ready. This was just a prototype. Um, but the second more problematic requirement we had is that the VM should be small and understandable by the client maintainers. And by client maintainers, I mean uh, all of those people who maintain Ethereum clients, because remember our main goal is to introduce WASM to Ethereum. Um, and those people, at least today, they understand the EVM. It's, it's pretty simple. They understand every single part of the system. And if you want to introduce like WebAssembly to them, you are introducing a black box. Um, so the requirement is if we can make this black box to be understandable by them, then there's a much better chance of acceptance. And just as a remark, I, I said that we also used, um, you know, these exper uh, the, the experience we gained uh, to improve the AVM. Um, so here's like an overview of what we had of the different interpreters in mid 2019. Um, just one sec. Um, and so basically these were the, the interpreters at the time. There was Binary and Webit, Wasmi, Warmer, and then Dagon. And at least these were the ones we looked at. And speed-wise, Wagon and Binary, and they weren't really good. Um, so the choice was at Webit, Wasmi, and Warmer. Uh, but as I said, Webit wasn't really 
production oriented. Um, you know, as we discussed, at least we, we placed a question. Uh, Webit is more like a toolkit, and it's it's really just a um, an implementation of the specification. It's not really designed to be like a production tool, at least not like in, in such a context we wanted it to be. Um, and that that just left us with Wasmi and Wammer. Um, and our issues we have found with Wasmi and Wammer was like the integration part, integrating Rust with different languages wasn't really um, nice at the time. And the Wammer not only had an interpreter, it also had um, an AOT, AOT and JIT. So it was just a large code base. So all of these meant that we decided to create Fizzy, uh, which, which is just an interpreter. Um, so we started to work like end of uh, 2019. And little did we know that Wasm3 and SSVM would, uh, would also be released soon, which are basically the competitors of Fizzy. Um, so finally, we got to Fizzy at this point. Um, and I'm just going to list the different goals we have. Um, and we have four categories of goals. The first category is, is the code quality. Um, we really want to have a small code base, you know, because of the, the reason I mentioned. And we also don't want any kind of external dependencies, you know, if we can avoid them. If you want extremely clean and readable code, and it has to be easily embeddable. Um, the second category is, is simplicity. Um, this is an interesting one. So we only want to support WebAssembly 1.0. And it's, you know, this is a question, what, what is WebAssembly 1.0? Uh, we started to maybe, you know, wrongly, at least internally, refer to the MVP as 1.0. And Pavel in the next talk will, um, uh, I think, explore this topic in more depth. Um, but basically what we mean is the, the MVP without any of the extensions. Uh, of course, this doesn't mean that none of the ex extensions would ever be supported, but the goal is that uh, those extensions would only be supported once they're like fully final, deployed everywhere. Uh, up until that point, they're really just experiments, at least you know, in the eyes of physics. Uh, we really just want an interpreter and we don't want to support any uh, additional feature apart from binaries. The, the, we don't want to deal with you know, any, any more complexity. The code has to be small. Um, the next set of goals is, is conformance. We really want to have a high unit test coverage um, and, and you know, we want to be really strict on testing. We want to pass every single possible test. Um, and lastly is you know, first test support for blockchains. Um, so you mentioned a couple of things, um, the, the floating point, uh, metering, the important part with metering here, so far I only mentioned injected metering because we didn't want it to modify a VM, but here we have the opportunity to modify a VM. And doing runtime metering, doing all of this in the VM itself um, is much nicer in the sense that it is much more optimal. Um, and so we implemented uh, metering and, and it is, is uh, you know, much better speed-wise compared to injected metering. Um, and the same applies to the call depth bound if you don't need to inject it, but you can modify the VM, it is obviously cheaper and faster. And what I mentioned regarding 256-bit numbers, um, that is like a ma major goal to have a efficient um, and, and um, good API for uh, big numbers. Um, and I, here I extended it that not only 256-bit, but modular arithmetic uh, for arbitrary widths um, you know, with limits, of course, would be really nice. And this is a project we have worked in the context of EVM. And, you know, those findings would be easy to apply into this uh, context of physics. Um, so here's some, some numbers in, you know, what physics looks like today. Uh, the core logic itself, and by this I mean the, the parser, the instantiation part, and the execution part, um, the these are the actual lines. So it's, uh, I didn't go at looking at the, the number of statements, but the actual lines in the file, it's only 3,500 lines in total. Um, and we have 100% unit test coverage. Of course, we pass all the upstream tests. And according to our measurements, we are the second fastest interpreter on the market after Wasm3. Uh, here's some speed comparison. Uh, I only listed uh, these three because these three VMs are integrated into our benchmarking system in Fizzy itself. Uh, we did head um, 
uh, some PRs to also support SSVM and to support uh, Wammer. Uh, but yeah, we had some issues with the, the APIs of, of those um, VMs and found some, some bugs or at least, um, um, you know, maybe things we didn't fully understood. I think we did open some, some issues upstream, um, but we couldn't fully like integrate those into our benchmarking um, system. That's why they're excluded here. Um, but uh, we do have wasn't free and Webit. And I think what we found in general that Fizzy is like two to five X lower than, than wasn't tree, but is um, five to 10 X faster than Webbit. And we did do measurements outside of this benchmarking framework in, in Fizzy um, with these, these other VMs. Uh, and there we have, we have seen that the, at least SSVM and, um, and Wammer at the time, they were of similar speed of Webbit. This may have changed in the past few months because we haven't run those since uh, like early summer, but at a time they were, you know, similar to the Webbit in speed. Um, and this is a particularly heavy uh, benchmark um, uh, of uh, uh, basically um, signature recovery uh, for Ethereum, uh, which is, you know, one of the uh, uh, frequently used uh, functions. Um, and the next benchmark is, is just uh, four smaller um, um, benchmarks, uh, two hashing, um, and just regular mem set, which of course would be solved by one of the Wasm extensions. And lastly, just a, um, a 256 bit implementation. Um, and here you can also see that uh, Fizzy is uh, unfortunately not beating Wasm tree, but is, is well in the middle. Um, okay, so a, a few more, I guess just some of the features I wanted to summarize about Fizzy itself is uh, we have decided to use C++ for the core implementation. And um, initially we did use exceptions for everything, um, but um, we did, um, that was more like a, a temporary measure. We didn't really wanted to use exceptions, uh, you know, indefinitely. Uh, but we did remove them from everywhere except parsing. And this provided quite a big boost. Um, we do have a public C API. The C++ API is not public and it's internal, but the external API is a C API and it has a, a CMake integration. We also uh, looked into uh, adding support for the, the WASM C API and the WASM C++ API, uh, which is used by um, some of the other uh, VMs. Um, but so far we haven't done that because it, it is quite a, a complicated um, API in terms of the number of interfaces which need to be uh, uh, introduced. The, the WASMC API header file itself, I believe is, you know, as long as the, the entire source code of uh, like Fizzy itself. Um, we do have a Rust binding and we do have what was the support. It's not like uh, fully complete, um, um, but it's easy to complete each of the, the functions we just um, didn't have time for them. Uh, we have a benchmarking tool, which I mentioned, uh, Fizzy Bench, um, and it, uh, it, it is easy to extend with, with new test cases. Um, it is, and that, that is what I used for the, the charts before. And we have runtime metering. Um, then on the testing, uh, I just wanted to mention a few things here, but Pavel will go really deep dive into this. Um, so of course we have unit tests, uh, which, um, which we used with uh, to, to find issues um, uh, like test cases, which were uncovered by, by upstream. Um, but we do have a, a runner for the spec tests. Um, as I mentioned, we don't really have support for um, the text WebAssembly format. Mm, and that is not a problem because we can use Webit's was to JSON uh, to translate the test cases. Uh, and that's what we do. Um, that was one of the, the only reason we would ever wanted to have the text format is for spec tests. But since uh, Webit has this tool, we, that was a really good find. Um, and lastly, we have a special uh, testing tool uh, based on this Berkeley test float, uh, which is um, a quite large test suite uh, to um, compare against uh, IEEE 754 floating point conformance. Again, Pavel, we're, we're talking in more detail about this. Um, okay, so I think I like these are the two main um, features left 
uh, to be done on Fizzy. And the first one I mentioned, like exceptions, is uh, we want to get rid of. And that would require quite a, um, I mean, not like a, an insanely big, but quite a big refactoring on the parser. Uh, but it would be nice to, to get rid of uh, because that could also mean that Fizzy can be compared to WASM2. I'm not sure how useful that is, but uh, uh, of course, that's, that's very um, you know, funny to do. Um, and the, the big, big number API I, I keep mentioning, uh, we do have different versions of it, but we don't really have a final and then well, uh, well designed uh, one. That would be the, um, you know, one of the, the major uh, last remaining items for Fizzy. Um, and we could also consider some, some further restrictions of complexity by adding limits to, to various, uh, various fields in WASM itself. Initially, we thought that this could provide quite a big boost, but now uh, I think we're leaning towards that maybe this isn't really uh, such, wouldn't be such a huge improvement. Um, but it may be something, you know, worthwhile to, to consider in the future. So now, you know, two, almost two years have passed since uh, we made this um, table of, of the different VMs. And uh, in 2021, there are many more interpreters than in 2019. So the new additions are WASM3 and WASM Edge. Uh, WASM Edge is, is, is uh, the new name of SSVM and of course Fizzy. Um, I want to highlight that, um, you know, these labels, um, these are really subjective. Um, by production oriented, you know, we just mean that they're not designed to be, or at least, you know, based on, on our understanding or opinion, they, they're not really uh, the goal isn't to be used in, in like production blockchains or, or such use cases. Um, they're more like a, a hobby project or a, a academic research project. Um, or maybe they're like at an earlier time uh, where they, they really focus on like certain properties and not others. And one property uh, for WASM3 is the speed. Uh, in our um, experience, WASM3 is really just focusing on the speed currently and of course, they're, they're the, the best at that. It's, it's really hard to beat them, if not impossible. Uh, but we did find a few issues and bugs with WASM3, um, uh, which, which is, uh, is understandable given, you know, they're not really, at least at the time, they're not focusing on, on being like production ready software, they're focusing on uh, being the fastest. And I think they're gonna, they're gonna focus, you know, maybe shift focus once, you know, all the, the optimizations that features are there, um, but that's, you, you know, that's how we understand the space. Um, so based on, on, based on, on this table, I think the, um, like Vagon, Wasmi, Binary and Webit, they really haven't um, changed that much in the past two years. Um, but of course, Wasm3, Wasmh, Fizzy, and I believe Womer as well has got a lot of, um, development um, done to them. Okay, and I think you're probably at the 13 minute mark now. So I just want to, to similar, summarize you know, what we learned. Um, so what we learned is that creating a WASM interpreter is pretty simple, it's, it's easy. Um, when we sat down for like the initial um, uh, like hackathon for, for getting Fizzy done, we only spent less than a week together um, and, and we pretty much got like a working interpreter out of it. Um, that is, is not bad. So WASM isn't that complex. You can crack it, um, you know, in a week and create an interpreter. But we soon learned that making 100% correct interpreter isn't that easy. That's pretty hard. It took us quite a few months to, to get all this testing in place and every sin, single nitty gritty detail in place to fully pass the, the spec tests. Um, I think it took us probably close to five, five, six months to get to this point. But making sure that all of this, you know, while being 100% correct is also really fast, that is an extremely hard task. Um, I would say at least getting to the current speed, uh, it took us an additional like three, four months. So in total, probably it took us like 12 months to get where we are at um, being 100% correct and you know, the speed we have. Um, so I guess the takeaway here is that creating a WASM VM is not that bad, but being correct and fast, that's quite a challenge. That's, that's really all I wanted to say about Fizzy. 
um, please check out the project uh, on this URL and shout out to the team, uh, which is Andre, Pavel and myself. And we do have a few uh, contributors. Um, thank you.